My name is Jose Casanova, and I'm a professor of sociology here at Georgetown and a fellow, a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center, uh, chairing the program on globalization, religion, and the secular. <clears throat> and it is my very, very special personal pleasure to welcome Friedrich Wilhelm Graf, a good friend and esteemed colleague to the Berkeley Center. Uh, professor Graf is professor of systematic theology and ethics at the Ludwig Maximilian Universität in Munich. Has been there since 1999, the year when he also received the very prestigious Leibniz Prize, one of the most prestigious prizes in German science. And it is precisely as part of a series of Leibniz lectures that he is now in the United States uh, under the sponsorship of the German Science Foundation. Uh, he gave a lecture uh, in New York on Wednesday on science and religion, moderated by the former president of Georgetown, Leo Donovan. And yesterday he gave uh, had a discussion, a forum discussion on ecumenism uh, at Catholic University. Um, Professor Graf is not only one of the most prominent evangelical theologians, German theologians, but he also is a very well known and influential public intellectual who plays an important role in this public discussions, uh, writes regularly for the leading German newspapers and participate in public forums. So it's a great pleasure uh, to have you here with us. And we thought of, since he gave the lecture on religion and science, the one in ecumenism, simply to invite him to give uh, uh, a presentation, an informal presentation, on the religious situation in Germany and in Europe in general today, uh, free hand to, talk on whichever, to touch on whichever topic he thinks important. Then we'll have a conversation trying to uh, go deeper into some of the issues, bringing back some of the issues perhaps on science and ecumenism, and then we'll open up the floor for discussion. So, Friedrich. Well, thank you very much, Jose, for your very kind introduction. It's an honor and pleasure to be with you. I've been to Georgetown University once as a tourist, went to around the campus, but visited my daughter who studied in Washington, D.C. for a while. I would like to start with a few remarks about the notion of Europe. Europe is a highly contested concept. We were never sure where the borders of Europe are. Is Turkey a part of Europe? Is Russia a part of Europe? Since 300 years, Europeans are talking about what Europe really means. One can ask, was the Dutch famous writer says Notabom, how does one become a European? And his answer reads as follows. First and foremost, by being one. And this is usually affected by having been born, for example, in the Netherlands. It also seems to be possible to be a European in Sicily, East Prussia, Lapland, and Wales. But simply because I am a Dutch European, it is probably best to speak thereof. So I am a German European. More precisely, I am a West German European. I was born in December 1948. This was the first generation of younger Germans after the first, uh, Second World War who grew up with a new democratic state. I'm a liberal Protestant. I'm engaged in some sociological research on Max Weber and Ernst Troitsch and so on. This is my perspective. This is my point of view. My first point is the many divisions of Europe. For nearly 200 years, scholars of very different disciplines have asked themselves what distinguished Europe from other cultures. How can it be uh, explained that Europe became the leading globally dominant expensive culture and civilization up until the early 20th century when the Americans took over? The decisive answer is Europe's specific political, technological, and scientific dynamic is the consequence of productive tensions. Europe has always been a continent of extremely great elementary differences. 
But aren't we all familiar with statements claiming that Europe is dominated by something like a common Christian culture, that em Europe embodies the Christliche Abendland, Christian Occident, and so on? This has been repeatedly brought up by different uh, religious actors, by the Pope, for example, in the controversy about a possible preamble of the constitutional treaty, which, as you all know, failed in the end. Not least the permanent controversies on the question of Turkey's accession to the European Union has often relied on arguments claiming that Turkey, as a dominant Muslim country, does not belong to Europe due to its entirely different religious culture and moral traditions. But it's important to see there is neither one Christianity nor the European Christian tradition. Christianity is a very plural word, and it would be prudent to speak of different Christianities and also of diverse European Christianities. First and foremost, of course, we must take note of the really elementary schism of Latin or Western Christianity on the one hand side and the Orthodox Christianities in Europe's East and Southeast. Many among us Western intellectuals are not well acquainted with the Eastern Orthodox Christian creeds. For most of us, they represent a very distant and mysterious religious culture. The theological and religious differences between Orthodoxy and the various Latin Christianities run very, very deep. They are of truly fundamental nature and can hardly be summed up in a concise theological or even sociological hypothesis. It seems evident that the Orthodox churches usually perceive themselves as Volkskirchen, people's churches, with a very strong nationalist bearing. They are forms of Christianity that display extremely authoritarian symbolic systems in their theological concepts. We need only think of the idea of God as Pantocrator, the Pantocrator. The ideal relationship between state and church is seen in the concept of symphonia, whereby they act in concert as the two fundamental pillars of public order that are to keep society in check. The different Orthodox Christianities are churches without homegrown traditions of enlightenment. Modern views, modern liberal views on freedom and liberty are, with very few exceptions, rather alien to them, even in the current day and age. This could be shown in detail. I don't want to go into details, don't worry. This could be shown in detail by looking at the so-called social doctrine of the Russian Orthodox Church from the year 2000. This document rejects the concept of human rights anterior to the state, as well as, as the idea that other religious communities in Russia should be granted the same legal protection as the Orthodox Church. That's an important topic for your work because you're working on religious freedom a lot in this center, I know. Neither the principle of free citizens nor the idea of a relatively autonomous civil society can based on this type of theology. Any criticism, for example, of Russia's relatively weak civil society cannot avoid taking into account the Russian Orthodox Church and its, in my view, very authoritarian theology. The Orthodox State Church plays an important role in the authoritarian reshaping of the political system. Within Latin Western Christianity, however, we have been confronted with a deeply influential division between Roman Catholic Christianity and the different Protestant Christianities. Lutheran Scandinavia on the one hand, a Catholic Latin Europe, as the sociologists of religion like to say, Jose does, likes this notion of the Latin Christianities or Latin Europe in Italy, France, Spain, and Portugal and the other. Seen in sociological terms, Europe is affected by an extremely high degree of diversity. And I haven't even begun to speak of Jewish, Muslim, and other minorities. Neither have I mentioned aggressive atheism, which of course also exists and plays quite an important role in some European societies, especially in Great Britain, the Netherlands, and so on. We must pay attention to the deep divisions in philosophy, religion, and politics 
that could be observed in many European societies since the enlightenment of the late 17th and 18th centuries. Let me cite France as an example for the fundamental division of public opinion between critics of religion and the churches and, uh, and the churches. In France, state and church are radically separated and the row over the two, or rather both Frances, is fought out again and again. This time concerning the question to what extent the state, in spite of all professed laicity, ICT, can or should help the Catholic Church and other religious actors gain more presence in public perception. Great religious diversity can also be observed on the institutional level in the legal status of the relationship between the state, the churches, and other religious communities. Any answer to the question of the social dimension of religion in civil society must take seriously the legal system, especially in its provisions on the religious communities and their place in society. Most European countries maintain secular states with constitutional guarantees protecting the freedom of religion for both individuals and groups such as the churches, Jewish communities, and so on. The sociological discourse on civil society often underestimates the role of the legal system, even though the member states of the European Union differ significantly in their constitutional law on religion and the way in which they regulate the role of the religious communities not least in their relation with the state. The European <laughs> Union has, for many good reasons, refrained from pushing for pan-European norms and a homogenization of national law in this area. We have a lot of regulations on a European level. You have to use the same beer bottles up in land, land and down in, Sic uh, in Sicily. You have an enormous lot of regulations, but one very important sphere of life has never been regulated by European legal, common legal standards. This is the area of religion, because this is very conflict-ridden. As opposed to other spheres of life, where the creation of a unified European legal structure is envisaged, the plethora of very different and historically entrenched steering systems in each member state led to the inclusion of this area from the integration process. Usually the Staatskirchenrecht or Religionsverfassungsrecht, the constitutional law on religion of a country, is a result of specific religious cultural preconditions. It is often very, very old and has been shaped by conflicts of the past. Within the European Union, we know of comparatively homogeneous denominational structures with de facto state churches. In Lutheran Denmark, for example, the ministers of the, the clergy of the Lutheran uh, Volkskirche are state officials, or in Orthodox Greece, where the church perceives itself of the, as the guardian of Greece, uh, Gr Greek national identity. Great Britain, on the other hand, has a very complex system of an established church, the Church of England, and many non-conformist churches and groups of dissenters. Yet another uh, situation can be found in Germany, where the churches and the Jewish communities are so-called corporations under public law, Körperschaften des öffentlichen Rechtes, which were closely with the state in a model known as limping separation. Hinkende Trennung von Staat und Kirche. Well, that was an, a very helpful solution in, the, in 1919 when, you, when the old state churches were broken down. Both the churches and the other religious corporations under public law are strong and influential actors. In addition, the social service providers linked to the religious communities are protected by the states and receive various types of public funding. Funding. The Protestant Diaconie and the Roman Catholic Caritas are the most important actors in social welfare, each employing more than 410,000 staff. This entails that roughly 840,000 people work in church-related organizations, 
maintaining hospitals, nursing homes, hospices, schools, and kindergartens, as well as a highly differentiated system of, uh, of assistance services for people with disabilities. Many of these institutions maintained by Caritas and Diaconi trace their foundations to the early 19th century and can thus look back on a long and rather successful history. Over the past 30 years, you could observe a significant change in their self-perception. The actors of Protestant or Lutheran diaconi had traditionally adhered to Luther's teaching of the three estates and envisaged a very authoritarian, social paternalistic ideal of the bonum commune, the common good of all people. This often resulted in prescriptive teachings and a disenfranchisement of those who required help. Not least due to the growing competition from private, secular, and profit-oriented suppliers of social services who attempt to earn money by employing new concepts of care, many actors in Caritas and Diakoni have undergone fundamental changes. More and more frequently, they perceive themselves as enterprises that need to remain profitable in order to develop better, more innovative products. OK, the point is important. Why? The German public perceives these organizations with great favor, and their reputation is, in any case, much better than that of the two great churches itself. This is an example relating to the differences in religious circumstances in Europe. General statements on the secularization of Europe, which you can find, as you all know, in American discourse about Europe quite often, general statements on the secularization of Europe cannot live up to this diversity. Can we really call a society secular when roughly one point Two million, uh, one point two million people work for the churches and the church-related welfare organizations. I do not wish to continue with this list of examples, but I want to emphasize the following. Even if we assume that many European societies are relatively strongly secularized, and even if the bond between the people and the traditional religious communities is weakening, Religion in general and Christian denominations in particular remain in all European or most European societies important cultural factors and societal forces. All European societies face the challenge of a new kind of religious pluralism as a result of human migration. They attempt to overcome these challenges within the framework of their own uh, legal standards, which actually brings very different conflicts in France and from Germany and so on. In Germany, for example, we are currently betting on the self-organization of the Muslim communities, a type of churchification of Islam, in order to grant them the same legal status as the churches, namely that of cooperation under public law. The issue of religious pluralism also demonstrates the high degree of diversity within Europe. You can often read, especially in the American press, that 17 million Muslims now live in the, United, uh, in the European Union. However, in my view, this is a very careless and unhelpful mode of speaking. How, uh, why? For what do Algerians and Moroccans in France have really in common with Turks from Anatolia in Berlin-Kreuzberg? Are the Pakistanis in Birmingham really the same kind of Muslim as the Indonesians in Amsterdam? There are, in my view, no religions or denominations. Instead, upon a closer examination, we can find a very colorful patchwork of many small religious environments. But in all European societies, we have great difficulties both in adequately comprehending this diversity and in addressing it politically. Well, I stop here. Thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to Jose's comments. Well, no, thank you very much for this wonderful uh, overview of the very, very complex uh, uh, map, religious map and situation in Europe. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, uh, simply probe a bit further into a few issues that you have touched upon. Uh, 
It was very good that you brought orthodoxy. Uh, and let me precise it was this religious pluralism that creates the challenge of ecumenism, both Christian ecumenism, right, Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox, uh, but also, I thought, it, yeah, uh, but also Abrahamic ecumenism, Christian, Jewish, Muslim. Um, I'm raising this question to what is the status or the standard situation of ecumenism today when Karol Wojtyla, the Polish uh, Pope, was elected, he viewed it as a providential call to establish a ecumenical dialogue with the Orthodox churches. I'm the first Slavic Pope. My task is to establish precisely this ecumenical dialogue. When the first uh, 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 German cardinal after Luther was chosen Pope, I thought that Cardinal Ratzinger will also see this election as a way of establishing a ecumenical dialogue with the Protestant churches. Uh, what has happened in the, it seems that somehow the ecumenical dialogue between Protestants and Catholics was actually better before, let's say, 10 years ago than today. So what is happening to ecumenism in general in Europe, Christian ecumenism, and ecumenism particularly in Germany? I mean, as, a, as an evangelical uh, 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 professor in Catholic Bavaria, then uh, you have a chance to, to get into these kind of conversations quite often. Well, 30% of all people living in Munich are Protestants. I know, I Catholic. know you feel comfortable in Munich, I know. <laughs> you even rejected great appointments in Humboldt and the Wissenschaft's colleague in Göttingen, so I know that. Okay, okay. <laughs> no. Well, in, I would, uh, my answer would be try to differentiate the concept of ecumenism. Both churches in Germany have an interest in cooperation, and if they do things together, the political influence is much more effective than if they don't cooperate. I would call this political ecumenism. And again, ecumenism has been an important part in the history of the Federal Republic. Why? Germany has been a society which experienced a lot of class struggle and a lot of culture wars. So after 1945, in building the new democratic state, you had a clear agenda. No more class struggle, but soziale Marktwirtschaft. You know, a, a, well, a Rhineland type of capitalism with strong institutions that negotiate class, uh, and, uh, class interests. And you had the idea no more culture wars between Catholics and Protestants. So this ecumene in Germany had always a very strong political impact. Now the system is quite stable. Uh, you find Catholics in the Social Democratic Party, you find Jews by, uh, and Muslims engaging in the Christian Democratic Party and so on. So this type of ecumenism has become a normal thing. And you find a type of quotidian ecumenism. Catholics going to Protestant churches, Protestants going to Catholic churches. Religion has become optional. Something very, very different is happening on the institutional level. You have some theological functionaries who are writing beautiful papers about consensus, but this doesn't change anything. So you disappoint people. And the Pope himself, he has always been very much interested in dogmatical questions. He would prefer to talk to orthodox bishops, to the orthodox churches, to find common ground on questions like the offices in the churches, church structures, authority in the church, and so on. He still has the notion that most Protestant churches are not real churches, at best uh, something like communities with some church elements in it, yeah, kirchliche Gemeinschaften. And this pope, well, when I was a young man, I studied with him, I have to say. This pope is, well, He's now saying what he said in the 1950s and 1960s. It's an astonishing continuity in his thinking. 
And this is a generation of Germans. He's the same, he was born in the same year like Jürgen Habermas. This is a generation of, uh, a generation of German intellectuals who had their experiences with the Nazi dictatorship and tried to find their way out. And his way of finding out is believing that a strong religious institution is very important for civil society and Protestant churches, in his view, are not really strong religious institutions. So you can explain why contact or dialogue with the Orthodox churches is much more important to him, but he has to pay a price. He can't talk with them about certain uh, ethical questions, because especially in Germany, both churches had a long, long way to go until they were able to accept basic principles of liberal democracy, human rights thinking, and so on. See the very authoritarian Lutheran ethics in the 19th and uh, early 20th century. You have done research on uh, the Lutheran tradition of Zwei Reiche Lehre, and so on. This has always been used for constructing very authoritarian political ideas. So talking only with the Orthodox churches will bring a lot of conflict into the Roman Catholic discourse in regard to human rights, in uh, regard to certain understandings of Since autonomy. I see there is interest in continuing this question, let's change the plan and go. But Bishop Huber, the head of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Germany, and Cardinal Casper used to have a better relationship, and then something happened. What happened? No, but before, no, 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 no. <coughs> before, before he retired, before he retired, what happened? Okay, now let me, let me say two things. The relationships on a personal level are always very, very good. One is polite to each other. I have a lot of Catholic students, I have a lot of Catholic friends, and so on. But in the end, this is within a certain frame of reference. And the frame of reference is being quite happy that we arrived in a democratic German political order. Okay? okay. This, is, this, is our, this, is, this is an important element of the story. Now, now you sometimes have political conflict. It's the same like in this country, biopolitics and abortion. And this brings, for example, this brings a lot of political conflict in both the parties. When you take the CDU, CSU, in questions of biopolitics, Protestants, members of parliament, are, uh, vote much more for liberal solutions, whereas you can find traditional Catholics who would uh, take a more, well, they would say principled stance. Uh, so. Right. I understand. So please identify yourself. I really Joe. appreciate uh, Joe Morelli. I'm John Borelli, and I worked in the president's office, but before that, many years at the Ecumenical Interreligious Affairs Office of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. I like your, I like the way you've distinguished between the lived level ecumenically and the level that has to happen on the functionary level. And I recall Cosper, and I don't think he liked doing this after the signing of the agreement on justification by faith, which took a lot of work. Remember, there was that last-minute Lutheran hesitation which had to be dealt with. But once it was done, then many on the lived level says, now we can start sharing communion. And no, this is not the end of everything. There's more to go. But he, I don't think he liked doing that because of the enthusiasm that was generated on the, the lived level. So I wanted to ask you, number one, um, on the lived level, do uh, events like the Kirchentag, you still have that in Germany, don't you? Nothing, we have nothing similar to that here in the US. Uh, and we might explain if that's still lively and what goes on. Is there any kind of movement among Catholics like is happening in Austria, where clergy yes. and laity are saying, yeah. enough, we should, divorced and remarried Catholics should be welcomed back, we should loosen up some of the other principles and so forth. It's causing the bishops a lot of worries, but is there anything like that, any groundswell? And, and, and secondly, on the, on the higher level, does the World Council of Churches have any impact on the European scene um, in terms of ecumenism? Because, you know, 
within your 10 year period, Jose, we did have the agreement on the nature of church, which is a significant achievement, this church's communion. Yes. So. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for your question. I would like to try to answer it in three steps. The first step, yes, you find a lot of conflict within German Catholicism, and you find a lot of conflict, especially in complicated moral issues. Never before in German history we have seen so many legal struggles between people working for the church or the church-related welfare organizations and the churches itself. I give, I give you an example. The German Arbeitsrecht, you know, uh, allowed the churches to kick off people when they did not really, in their lifestyles, kept to the moral teaching of the churches. You had a doctor working for a Catholic hospital. He divorced and married his secretary, who was Protestant, and you could kick him off. off. OK, now you have fascinating new stories. There is a young Catholic doctor and he is getting engaged in civil partnership with another young man. Okay, can you kick someone out of his job when he is just doing what is his basic right, being allowed by state laws? So, when you take these conflicts to a European level and go to the European courts of human rights, the churches, will, the German churches as well as the uh, British churches will lose all their traditional privileges. That is going to happen at the moment. The European Union did not want to have any common European legal standards in regard to religion. They knew this would be, bring an enormous lot of conflict. But now, in regard to their anti-discrimination law, they suddenly went into these conflicts. This is happening at the moment. Second, conflict area is taxation. I don't want to go into details here, but e of course economy, uh, uh, f financial things play an important role. And the third is deep disappointment. When you tell the people that you are negotiating about the past and come to better understanding what once has been brought up tension and conflict and theological permanent conflict and so on, they expect something on, th they, want, they want to see what has happened now, they want to experience it. You can say we have signed a few theological documents, but there are so many other questions, so you can't attend uh, a Protestant service. It's not a real good service. So you created a lot of disappointment and this is especially important in Germany because this is the only European society where you have third, a third of the people are Protestants, a third of the people are Catholics, another 10% of the people belong to smaller Christian or half Christian communities. Yeah. Okay, so they are still extremely influential and on the background of this old class struggle, uh, culture wars and class struggle and so on, people have a longing for better understanding. Just give me, give you an example. I'm a pastor of the Lutheran Church of Bavaria, but in August I've done two Catholic funerals. Why? This was a friend and his mother has asked him that she, she should ask me. So I rang the Catholic priest and asked him whether he would agree that I do it. And he said, I don't care, which I don't think is a really good answer, Catholic answer. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, and this is, this is happening. Religion becomes optional, and there is a lot of tension with, uh, within the Roman Catholic Church in Germany by one very simple reason. There is a really dramatic lack of young clergy and a really dramatic lack of theology students. And again, we are living in a booming market, capitalist market economy. Young theologians have 
excellent chances on the job market. They go to insurances. They go to, well, uh, human resource departments. And uh, they can do many, many things, can go to the media. This is much more attractive than becoming a priest who has to hide uh, a relationship to whomever. So the situation has changed significantly during the last 20, 30 years, and especially the Roman Catholic Church hasn't found an answer to that problem. And again, José is the sociologist. What will happen to German ecumenism when Protestant clergy will be domin dominantly female and there is a lack of Catholic clergy? I don't know. 36% of all Protestant pastors in Germany are female at the moment, but in a few years it will be 60 to 70%, because the majority of theology students in theolo Protestant theological faculties in the country is female, and when they enter church, you know, the situation will change very soon. I do think this will have somehow an impact, but I can't tell you which. Last point, of course you find groups of priests who organized themselves in the same way as you have it in Austria and in Switzerland, but you have an enormous lot of tension even on the level of the bishops' conference. And again, we have many people leaving the church, and again, Unfortunately, we have the same problem as you could see in Ireland and the United States, a misuse or abuse scandal. The floor is open. Yes, this is popular. Both the Kirchentag as well as the Katholikentag. Okay, it's a biannual gathering of groups in the church, and it's always 60,000 to 70,000, sometimes for special events, even more than 100,000 people showing up, hearing lectures, praying alternative prayer. This is something like a demonstration of religious pluralism in both the big churches, you find groups being organized in keeping up sensibilities for the, as they call it, integrity of creation, closely linked to the Green Party and its milieu. You find uh, people there who are engaged in many other grassroots activities. This is a marketplace, but a politically important marketplace. No influential German uh, politician would miss to go to a Katholikentag or a Kirchentag because it's like a stage where you can uh, present your own ideas. And again, part of the very complicated situation, a very differentiated situation is the fact that, of course, in Eastern Germany, the religious conditions or the religious landscape is very, very different from the former West Germany. East Germany is the only European society, most people do not remember this, is the only European society that has experienced both totalitarian dictatorships of the 20th century. They had not a national socialism, and then they had more than 40 years communism, with the uh, astonishing fact that a third of the members of the Communist Party in East Germany, the SED, had formerly been members of the Nazi Party. You know? Yes, that's astonishingly... And it's been already a long history of secularization <laughs> in Prussia. And they had, and so it's, it's, it's a story of its own. Yes, please. situation. How is Eastern Germany, the former Eastern Germany, how is that religiously different from former West Germany? Okay. Maybe I'm just not understanding what you're saying. Okay, sorry. 
Look, the wall was built in 1961. Before the wall was built, people could uh, leave East Germany and go to the western parts of the country. 4.9 million people did so. This was mainly the middle classes, the Protestant middle classes. So before 1961, a lot of Protestant church members went to the West. Again, the GDR, Communist Germany, had a very repressive policy in regard to the churches. So again, many people left the church because they wanted to have a normal career in politics and in s universities and so on. So it's, uh, you find cities in, or places in Eastern Germany where there is just 10% of the population still a member of a Christian church. But this does not mean I would not like to talk about secularization. Why? At the same time, you find people who are longing to bring their children, to take their children to Christian schools. Christian schools are booming in the East. And specific places, important places of cultural memory, of political memory, are very, very attractive to people who are not members of the churches. I take the most, uh, most uh, famous example, the Frauenkirche in Dresden, which was uh, destroyed in the end of the war, as you all know. It was rebuilt after the unification of the country. And it's a booming religious place. Ten services overcrowded Sunday by Sunday. And a lot of tourists. Well, yes. Not, not local. Jose, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's tourists, it's locals, it's... I think that, well, first, East Germany is the only society in Europe in which a majority of the population declare themselves atheist. A majority, 51% the last. And uh, it's a society post-Soviet that has had no religious revival in a strong sense. Of course, there are those elements, those elements of symbolic reconstruction of memories. But the chain of memory is so broken yes. that among youth, they have no relationship whatsoever to Christian culture, to the most <coughs> And again, Jose, I, I do agree, but most young people, and many young people from the East, go west or go, go south because they can make much more money, you know. But, okay. Yes. Could you comment on how Angela Merkel's upbringing as the daughter of a clergyman has shaped her worldview, and specifically in what ways does it manifest itself in German politics towards various religious sects? Okay, this is an extremely complicated question because I sometimes talk to her but we do not talk about this question because she doesn't like to talk about this question. And this has a lot to do with the fact that her father was one of the very few Germans of his generation who didn't go from east to west, but from west to east. She was born in Hamburg. And it was by the religious and political convictions of her father, he thought that the other Germany, the socialist or communist Germany, would in the wrong, long run be the better society. He was organized in a group of uh, Protestant pastors in Berlin, Weissenseer Kreis, uh, who have, were strongly pro-socialist. She, in a certain way, distanced herself from the political views and religious attitudes of her father, but being a very pragmatic type of politician, being fed up with ideologies, being interested in successful modeling through, she wouldn't like really to, 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 say anyth uh, she, to say anything about this in public. But of course she is a Protestant, of course she knows that the churches are important actors in German society. But in questions of biopolitics, for example, she is decidedly more liberal than some of her Catholic uh, supporters. Sorry, I could I can't say more. Okay. 
the German society, or Germans uh, were not really able to accept that Germany is an immigrant society for a long time. For a long time, we had the belief that those people who came to seek jobs and so on would leave the country somehow. This was very naive. But since the late 90s, there is a great political consensus between the Social Democrats, the Greens, the Liberals, and the CDU, CSU, that immigration is an extreme, extremely important topic. Uh, we are trying to negotiate the complicated legal situation in regard to those pious people who do not organize themselves. Let me give you an example. We are just building up four faculties for Islamic theology in the German university system because we do want that German Muslim clergy is educated or trained in the German university system. We would not like them. I was a member of a council who, who uh, organized things like this. Traditionally, they were sent by the Turkish government or came from Cairo and so on. And this is not a good idea in the long run. They don't speak German. They, are, they don't know German custom. They don't know s certain uh, standards of negotiating things. So the situation has changed. We are not only training uh, Muslim clergy, but we also have a strong need for Muslim school teachers because in clear antagonism to the Nazi experience, the German constitution from 1949 stated that the churches and other religious actors have the right to participate in religionsunterricht, in religious instruction, in state schools. So this is so, so you need Muslim teachers. And again, this is an interesting point. 80% of the students who are engaged in studies to become a school teacher doing Muslim instruction are female. This is the same as you find in Protestantism, and that might bring some conflict into the Muslim communities, because these are very strong young women who, who wouldn't like someone to come to tell them what they really have to believe and to do. The situation of the Jewish minority has changed after 1989. Uh, because then a lot of Jews from Russia came into Germany, so you have a lot of conflict within Jewish uh, communities between the old ones, who thought they were German Jews, and the new ones who came from Russia. But conflict seems to be an important element in all religious histories. Uh, yeah, Kevin Fitzgerald, uh, Department of Oncology and also the Center for Clinical Bioethics up at the Medical Center. And I'm one of the Jesuits here at Georgetown. So again, thank you very much. This is fascinating. And from your comments, it, it makes me wonder, how do you see the role of religious ecumenism going forward? Within this context, you've got Germany, of course, with, with, with your own sort of national interests and, and concerns, and you're trying to be part of the European Union and have that exist as some kind of entity as it negotiates with China, with India, and with a global institution like the Catholic Church, which, of course, is not always going to be focused on European issues and whatnot. So the, how does that dynamic play out in, in this arena? It's an extremely fascinating and good question, but an extremely difficult one. There is no European church policy. You find, well, you find a European conference of Catholic bishops. You find some organizations, NGO-like organizations, organizing Protestant interests. 
the Germans, both the German churches have representatives in Brussels. The British churches do the same. But even when you are right that the Roman Catholic Church is a Weltkirche, a global player, in certain respects, it is not true. Because the interests of the German Catholic churches or the Austrian ones, they have a very different understanding of their political role and their role in public society than, the, than some Catholic churches in Latin Europe. Of course, one talks to each other, but it's, it's, it's something really different. I think that the crisis that Europe has experienced or is still experiencing in financial matters will bring new discussions about the role of religion in society. Why? At the moment, it's more than 22,000 young Spanish people with an ac academic diploma who are learning German. When you really want to make money, go to Spain and build up a German language school. Uh, you, can, you know? This is a booming market. Yeah? Okay, so one of the elements of the Euro crisis is that inner European mobility by young, well-equipped, well-trained people is being has risen to a very new height. Um, my son, who is an engineer, he has eight Spanish colleagues now. Okay, this is a new experience. And of course, this changes the religious environment. Let me give you an example. You can often read in American books about uh, religion in Europe that there is secularization and you have always this image of empty churches. I can show you booming Catholic churches in Munich. It's, for example, Polish services. Because people go there and they, don't, they do not go by religious or purely religious reasons alone. This is a trade place. They can ne negotiate jobs black market jobs, they can negotiate about uh, mobility, bringing get, uh, money into Poland and getting a cheap ride and so on. So there is something like, Polish. sorry? And they can hear Polish and they can develop a sense of Polish identity. And the same is true for the Pentecostals. You have a lot of Brazilian Pentecostal services. You have 800 black Protestant Pentecostal pastors living and preaching sa Sunday by Sunday in Paris. You know, but we always read about Muslims, you know, and Muslim riots and so on. So mapping Christian diversity in Europe will be an important task for the future. We have just started to do so, you know, doing religious geography and so on. But Europe in religious terms will be much more plural, much more similar to the United States than it has traditionally been. Well, given the religious diversity... You introduce yourself, please? What? Introduce yourself, oh, Dr. Louis Wright, I'm in the library as a cataloger, but I had five years doing Stanford PhD work in Tübingen. Okay. And that's where I ended up working with Wolfgang Huber and Ulrich Ducrow yes. on a project on the misuse of the Lutheran Two Kingdoms doctrine in 19th and 20th century, mostly conservative Protestant theology. And it was a very interesting experience. But given the religious diversity of Europe today and the secularization, when Europeans speak about preserving Christian civilization from Muslim immigrants, what are they really saying? I don't know whether I really got your question right. Um, many immigrants, many migrants who came into European societies accepted that they came into societies 
there is something like which are strongly influenced by something that I would call a Christian basic culture. You have Christian holidays. I've never met any Muslim who rejected to receive Weihnachtsgeld in December <laughs> by religious reasons. Okay, that's part of our German corporate culture that people in December get more money than they get in the uh, rest of the year. Okay, of course they would accept this. Why shouldn't they? Oxo of course they would accept that, the, that uh, there is Easter holiday and so on. That's not the point. The important point is the same legal status, which they are granted under certain conditions, speaking the language and so on. And the second is a lot of conflict in regard to fundamental moral orders. I just met a man in New York who has written his a German, uh, who had written his PhD about gay Turks in Berlin. You know, this is, this is an interesting uh, g Turkish young gay man in Berlin. Okay, which, which type of, of identity do they develop? Most of them are very, very happy to live in Berlin because they can live their sexual identity without those restraints that they were suffering in when they lived in the rural country, uh, in the countryside, in the Turkish rural areas and so on. So, Again, we have weak sociological data, but the majority of Turkish migrants to Germany feel quite well to have arrived in Germany. They feel, they are mo they feel more integrated than, for example, people in the Netherlands and in Britain. And, in and especially in France. And again, we, 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 we we do not need to talk about the catastrophes of German and European history in the 20th century. But there is one very, very important difference between Germany and the other European nation states in this regard. Our Muslim migration doesn't have anything to do with the experience of colonialism. This is very different for young French Muslims who still know what has happened in Algeria and in Morocco and so on. This is different to the experiences in the Netherlands and in, with Pakistanis and so on. And, and I could add, xenophobic nativism is not allowed publicly in Germany. When you have groups which are xenophobic nativists, other Germans come to the support of immigrants. So in the public sphere, it's a much more restraint uh, against uh, public xenophobic anti-immigrant racist discourse that you find. I mean, you, you couldn't find the kind of combination of liberal anti-immigrant parties that you find either in, the, in uh, Denmark or in uh, Holland, or of course the traditional rightist xenophobic uh, nativist parties. So in this respect, both the fact that they had no colonialism, but also the fact of the Holocaust makes Germans especially, they went through a process of being extremely care careful with uh, uh, xenophobic arguments in the public sphere. And so, yeah. Any other? May I? Yes, of course. Um, okay. Professor Graf has been, of course, a great scholar of Max Weber. has been the president of, of the Ernst Rell Society for many, many years. And of course, both of them were the great Protestant thinkers. Their theory of linking modernity and uh, uh, Protestantism uh, there was, of course, the whole argument about Protestant modern Europe, uh, traditional Catholic Europe. These things had disappeared from the discourse for many, many decades. Uh, to a certain the European Union was based on not only the reconciliation of France and Germany, but the reconciliation of Protestant and Catholic parties uh, coming together, Christian Democratic parties in Holland. And, uh, Christian democracy linking both Catholics and Protestant was really the carrier of the European Union. Then came Islam as the other of Europe. And for me, it's interesting to see in the last two years in the public discourse, even in academic discourse, the old Protestant ethic thesis yes. coming back in relation to the economic crisis in Europe. In fact, Islam as a public issue has almost disappeared from the public discourse. 
and the conflict or tension between Northern Europe and Southern Europe has reopened the old thesis. So what do you think of this new discourse? It's only a temporary thing. Uh, to which extent really, really is, is not uh, something serious? To which extent is something serious? Well, again, a complicated, fascinating question. Jose, let me, let me start with a specific starting point. At the moment, we are talking in Europe a lot about, again, a lot about the different types of capitalism. You know these books written in Sweden 10 years ago, and uh, for a long time, many people in Europe believed that Anglo-Saxon capitalism will be much more effective than the old Rhineland type of permanent negotiations between all the actors in economy. At the moment, you find many, many people all over Europe who think that the old corporist type of soziale Marktwirtschaft or Rhineland capitalism will be more effective. Germany is less dependent on the financial markets than Britain, for example. Though, for a long time, many people believed that Brit the British model is a much better one. Again, as you have new plural religious environments, I think it's just a simple follow-up discourse to ask what makes people different in regard to their moral convictions, to work ethics, and so on. And then religion plays an important role. Even people who distance themselves from the church, who leave the Catholic Church, for example, of course, in a certain way, stay to be Catholics. And the same is true for Protestantism. Debates abo about Arbeitsethik, about conceptions of beruf or profession and so on play an important role. I do not like the rhetoric of Latin Europe because go to Milano, it's not really different from Monaco, from München and so on. So, you know, it's in a certain way, it's a misleading notion and go to some parts of Spain where you have, you have booming economy and so on. So... They're going to break away from Spain. Yes, Catalonia they... That's, the okay. <laughs> but, but, okay, that's, that's, that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting different topic. What will happen to the, to certain regions in Europe? When they get organized together, that will be an important, uh, an interesting development. Please. Please introduce yourself. I'm Leo Lefebure here at Georgetown. I'm Leo Lefebure at Georgetown University. How strongly has the crisis of the sexual abuse of minors affected the Catholic Church in Germany? And what's the impact of that on the credibility of the Catholic Church in the broader German society? Could you repeat the first part of okay, the, the, the crisis of the sexual abuse of minors by Catholic priests and others in Catholic positions of ministry? How strongly has that affected the Catholic Church in Germany, its credibility, its standing within the broader German society? Okay. It's, I'm not an anti-Catholic, I have to say, but I have to give you two extremely, well, bad dates. 89% of all Germans believe that the RDRC, that's the German, well, car worker, car drivers uh, support organization, sorry? It's the triple A. It's the German triple A, yes. It's more serious because Germans take... Driving cars very seriously. Okay. Even more than America. Okay. Eighty-nine percent of all Germans say that this is a trustworthy organization. It's only seventeen, or even thirteen. We have two different polls. Percent of the members of the Roman Catholic Church in Germany say that their own organization is a trustworthy organization. That means you have five Catholics, and four are not trusting the, their own church. The second, there's always been a strong movement since 20 years of leaving the churches. 
people just stepping out. Kirchenaustritt. Traditionally, it was more Protestants leaving their church than Catholics. Since three years, this pattern has changed. You find more Catholics leaving their church than Protestants, and quite a new development, conversion became attractive to some people. You have significantly more conversions from the Roman Catholic Church to the Protestant churches than the other way around. This, without any doubt, has something to do with the abuse scandal. And of course, this still plays an important role in the media. And of course, there is a very, very deep notion that the way the church tried to handle the problems did not really help to rebuild trust compared to the American. Well, this legal situation is very different. Uh, the German Catholic Church offered 5,000 Europe's uh, uh, euros to a victim, uh, which is, well, of course, seen by these victims as a scandal. There is a lot of legal conflict still going around, and uh, this will be a very important topic for a long while. But again, in my view, much more important is the question of missing young clergy. The German Catholic churches tried to solve this problem in two ways. The first way was importing Catholic priests from other countries. Okay, from the Philippines, from Africa, from Poland. Okay. Six, I, I, I told to Frau Steyer yesterday and to a friend of mine, a few weeks ago I attended a Catholic funeral in very, very traditional rural Bavaria. There was a Polish pope, uh, there was a Polish uh, uh, priest who could not even speak the name of the person for whom the funeral was. Okay, it's not really a good message when the Roman Catholic Church in Bavaria is not re uh, really able to do such elementary things like an, a good, you know, funeral service. Again, I think this in the long run is much more important than the abuse scandal. They are missing educated, well-trained young priests, and now they create, this is a second strategy, now they create Pfarrverbünde, association of parishes and so on, but this means that the social distance between clergy and lay people will grow again. This is a very quick question. In the United States, uh, both the Catholic Church and Protestant churches are having trouble with numbers of ministerial students. Uh, so it's very hard for Protestant churches to find pastors, especially in rural environments. Uh, the numbers of seminary students have been declining. So one thought was, well, even if the Roman Catholic Church allowed the ordination of women, in the long term, many of the Protestant churches with women as ministers are still experiencing a problem. Is this true in Germany in terms of ministerial candidates for the Protestant churches? No, it's not true at the moment. It may be true in a few years, but at the moment we still have enough female students who, are, who want to become a Protestant pastor. So, but I must say there is a lot of brain drain because a lot of brain drain. Being a good theologian, you can do so many things. The churches for a long time believed that those who study theology will one day be uh, working in the church. And this is no more the case. They can do so many other things. Okay. I'm Gene Rice. I'm a senior scholar at the Association of American Colleges and Universities here in Washington. 
Um, as you talk about uh, what's happening in Germany, I was wondering if Bonhoeffer's religionless Christianity is resonating. Are you getting house churches where you don't have clergy, where you do have people that are getting together? Actually, it's even taking place in China. And uh, is this a, a, a new kind of, of movement? And is Bonhoeffer seen as a key player there? Well, Bonhoeffer, of course, is a very, very important person in the Protestant cultural and religious memory. You find thousands of Dietrich Bonhoeffer Kirchen all over the country. You find uh, political, or you have a political agenda where remembering those who opposed National Socialism play an important role. But he is a fascinating person and he is an interesting theologian, but his analysis of religionsloses Christentum, I don't believe that they are really to the point. Why? The same time people are stepping out of the church, they, many of them engage in very, well, interesting religious practices. You have a market, a booming market for alternative spirituality. And you do not have it outside the churches only, you have it inside the churches. Go to Jesuit, uh, uh, I, I know I'm naughty now. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Go to Jesuit Spirituality Center and do your Thai massage there. You know? You find this all over Europe. That's the case. <laughs> you know? And uh, so, so you don't find a lot of religionsloses Christentum, but you find a lot of Christianity combined with plural spiritual offerings, healing your body, using warm stones, and all these kind of stuff. So, in this regard, I think Bonhoeffer's description of the role of Christianity in modernity was just wrong. And, and even the argument of the house churches in, in, in China or the basic Christian communities in Northern America. I mean, they are not churches in the ecclesiastical sense of national Landeskirchen, but those are religious communities. So it's a different uh, yes. Uh, my name is John Taylor. I'm from the State Department's Office of International Religious Freedom. It's happened many times before, but most recently with this uh, video clip produced in, in California, where uh, Muslims in Europe particularly, I think, can say, why is it okay, why can you go to jail for denying the Holocaust, but you can say whatever you want about the Prophet Muhammad or the Quran or anything about Islam, and uh, they see that I think is inherently unfair. And it would seem there's probably three ways to deal with this, or maybe others you could think of. One is to keep things the way they are and uh, try to explain that these two things are not uh, uh, equal or shouldn't be compared with each other. Or you could expand uh, laws to include blasphemy or other types of, uh, you know, criminalize disparaging religion. Or you could relax the laws that exist and say, we're not going to have anything protected anymore. What do you think is the, the best way forward on this, or maybe some other way that I haven't thought of? Including the Snyder. Okay, no, I'm not. <laughs> okay, yes, I, I knew you would. I, no, I knew mean, you. Just okay. Argument, right? okay. Let's expand. Right? Did you read German? No. Did you read German? I did not. Okay. This is a big argument and circumcision, obviously, directed at yeah. Muslim, but bringing the Jewish community into right, that. Right. Into the, yeah, but anyhow, please. I don't want to bring it, but since it is related to the issue of how do you Okay. I do think that any blasphemy laws will not help and change the situation. Blasphemy has always been a very contested legal instrument. 
I've published an article in the Swiss daily newspaper Neue Zürcher Zeitung where I try to show that definitions of blasphemy always have a specific cultural and societal context. There was a famous German philosopher called Immanuel Kant, and he tried to show that... Famous? Sorry? <laughs> what did he say? No, no, was he famous? <laughs> <laughs> and he tried to show that the idea that one can offend God is extremely contradictory. So in a German encyclopedia of the early 19th century, you can read the sentence, God cannot be offended, therefore blasphemy laws have no content. Okay, later in the 19th century, German legal experts thought about, a lot about religious emotions. Okay, religious emotions are similar to aesthetic emotions. I sometimes meet people in public who are dressed that my aesthetic emotions are violated. <laughs> Can I expect the liberal state to protect my aesthetic emotions? They are different from other people's aesthetic emotions. One just has to look around, you know, go to New York City or so. Go. Okay, this is part of modern society. And any, any idea of protecting religious emotions by new blasphemy laws will not bring more societal peace, but will bring a lot of new conflict. It's my view, it's counterproductive. And I think one can explain young German citizens with a Muslim or especially Turkish background that the topic of the Holocaust is extremely important for the collective memory and political identity of the democratic German nation state. Why? Jose already mentioned this. There was a very strong, extremely fundamental political consensus in Western Germany. Never again Nazism. This is, this is part of our political DNA. You know, never again what we have experienced and the other Europeans with us. So the laws that are banning to show Nazi signs in public and so on. They are part of our overlapping consensus. And I think that young migrants coming to Germany will accept this. But of course, I know that some people really feel offended. And of course, I don't like uh, Protestant pastors in the south, uh, south, southern parts of the United States to do those stupid things, but many stupid things happen in uh, open societies. I will add the final question, but two more questions very quickly will gather. But I just want to remind ourselves when the German Pope was willing to let back into the Catholic Church uh, Holocaust denier Bishop Williamson from the Pius X society, the Ch German Chancellor Merkel, they are to chastise the Pope. So this and, is a very, it's and, a very strong... And, the, and he is still on... Uh, there are still, you know... Oh, they're still fighting, but... Trials, still, no, still, still, still a going trial on. going on in Regensburg and so yes. on. So yeah. let's, let's gather the two final questions and then we'll give the final word to... Yes, my name is Ellen bassinger Chasso, and I'm a retired uh, theology uh, student professor. Um, when I was in Europe this summer, there was a big ado about uh, banning circumcision in Germany. I think it came out of Berlin. And of course, uh, it was a practice that really uh, infuriated the uh, 
Muslim and Jewish community. It came out of the idea that it was uh, a violation of the integrity of the child, the newborn or you know, already grown child. So I don't remember how that was solved, if it was maintained or if they um, agreed to have a religious uh, exemption for that. But that's an example of new conflicts that arise when you have a multiple religious pluralism. Yes. Uh, especially lots of Muslim uh, do uh, continue this practice of circumcision, uh, male circumcision. So how would you address that in the context of Germany? So the final question. Thank you, and thank you very much for your comments. Um, I'm Susan Taylor, and I'm with the National Office uh, here in Washington, D.C. of the Church of Scientology, and I've been working on these international religious freedom issues now for probably close to 30 years. Um, you have been talking about the migration of, of individuals and humans, and also we also have migrations of various religions and introductions of new religious faiths into various countries, and including Germany. Um, and in your case, uh, such as you know, the Hare Krishnas, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the Scientologists, etc. Um, and in most cases, um, these new religious minorities are composed of German citizens um, who have taken on a new faith. Um, yet, in many cases, uh, these people uh, of the new faith are restricted not only from their faith being recognized um, by the German government as an official religion, but also members are denied from various employment opportunities. And I was just wondering if you could speak to um, how do you see this new dynamic of new faiths coming into the country over the last 20 years or so playing out um, with respect to um, how these new faiths are moving towards gaining uh, official recognition in Germany. Okay. That's two very, very big issues, but I try to give a clear-cut, short answer. The circumcision case, it's not a German problem. There was one German lower law court who had, who had, who had ruled that in a very specific case, the integrity of a young boy was hurt. We have a lot of conflict about circumcision in Israel. We have a lot of conflict about circumcision in Britain and the Netherlands and France. So it's a problem that has a lot to do with conflicting norms. You can say that the norm of integrity of the body or integrity of the person a very enlightened norm combined to images of autonomy and individual freedom, that this is more important in a specific case than the idea of religious freedom. This must be negotiated. The German solution at the moment is that the Ministry of uh, Legal Affairs had a new, well, amendment to the German uh, Bürgerliches Gesetzbuch that under certain circumstances circumcision is allowed. But this just was brought by the government into parliament and there is opposition in the parliament. And I cannot say, I'm not willing to say at the moment that all those who oppose these laws are really without good arguments. For example, the nearly all European, again not German, uh, organizations of pedi pediatrists, uh, yeah. Kinderarzte? Yeah. Pediatricians. Yes? Yeah. Pediatrists. They say it's really a very complicated matter. So, I can describe the situation as I introduced myself as a Protestant liberal. I have quite a lot of reformed Jewish friends and many of them would say the same about the problem as some very liberal uh, 
public lawyers would say. So it's in the making. I would prefer not to have a German solution, but to find European solutions. You have special laws for the conflict in some member states of the European Union. You have a, law, a special law regarding circumcision in Denmark. You have the same in Sweden. You have the same in Norway. So let's talk about Europe in this respect. Second point, the, compli the situation has complicate, uh, is more complicated than it was because the public sensitivity for misuse and neglecting fundamental human rights has grown in the last 20 or 30 years. This is part, actually, of the misuse scandal discourse. You know, that we have better images. You are not allowed in Germany, for example, really to, be, uh, to, to treat your children in a way as once our grandparents, our grand-grandparents treated their children. Okay, so the situation has changed. And a third very complicated question, there is a basic norm in our constitution that all people are equal in front of the law. It's not easy to ban female circumcision and allow male circumcision. This is what is going on in the legal discourse in Germany, a very differentiated legal discourse at the moment. It's really a complicated matter. Many reformed Jewish communities, they have circumcision in a very symbolized way. They don't do it, but they talk about it, which I think is quite a good solution, a Protestant solution, I know. <laughs> okay. Americans, everybody does it. Half of, the, half of the children at one time were circumcised okay. in every American hospital. Yes, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> and it's medical discourse as well, and there is difference between the United States and Europe and so on. Okay, again, an extremely complicated topic. Yes, there is a lot of new faith in Germany. I don't think that I would agree with your description that people are really not respected by the government. There's a special case I know in regard to Scientology. Very special. Good, eh? Very special. A very, very special and complicated case. Uh, no, I don't think that people are suppressed in their career chances or so. It's, again, part of the fundamental sh change in religious landscapes. I tell you, a story which is crazy, but that's true. There was a group of Austrian law students who were drinking beer one night and had the idea of founding a new religion. They believed, it was a joke, they believed in the great mystery monster. They were drunken when they invented that the great mystery monster is really a very important divine actor. And then they went, as law students, up to the Austrian constitutional court, telling that they have certain rights, having been oppressed by the Austrian majority, of the majority of the Austrian people, in their fundamental religious rights. They won many of their legal battles. So it's part of the political DNA in Germany that religious freedom is important. But at the same time, you have what I try to explain, this very specific situation that the traditional religious organizations, like the Catholic Church, the Protestant Church, the Jewish communities also, are 
corporations under public law. Now you have the same for the seven-day Adventists, you have the same for smaller Protestant communities like the Baptists and so on. It's a permanent, it's a permanent process of legal negotiation. Scientology is a special case. If I may add with uh, an anecdote, a very special case, and I don't understand the obsession with Scientology in France and Germany, in both countries, but they are obsessed. Uh, I was once invited to be the William James visiting professor in Bayreuth University. Well, means that for five days I was a civil servant of Bayern. I had to. Mm -hmm. And when you become a civil servant of Bayern, you have to point out that you were never a member of these following four categories. A former Nazi or any kind of former organizations link. A former Stasi or Communist East Germany. Uh, Yihadis or Muslim terrorists. And the fourth category was Scientology. Uh, for me, it was rather shocking to find uh, uh, putting Scientology together in these categories of former Nazis, former Stasis, uh, Yihadis, and so So this is, again, there is something there. And, and, and it's a, I think that it is uh, it's not justifiable, but it's there. It's, it's a fact. Right. Especially since uh, we are recognized, uh, or have been recognized in the, the German courts, uh, not by the administration, but in the German courts, many, many cases, at least 30 or more as a religion, and then recognized in the country of Spain as a religion. Et cetera, et cetera. France and Germany, this is yeah, Europe. This is Europe. Cases, yeah. Well, we are very thankful to all of you for coming, especially thankful to Professor Graf for uh, enlightening us on so many different issues. Uh, thank you very much.